Welcome to Grace Point, and glad you're here today. I'm excited about what I'm going to share with you uh, this morning. This last week, a couple days ago, I was running on the treadmill, and as usual, I was doing anything I could uh, at that moment to not know I was running. So I was listening to uh, a podcast by uh, Kerry Niehoff. Uh, He does a podcast on Christian leadership, and he had a special guest. His name is Laurel Buckingham. He is a a longtime pastor of the um, Montauk Wesleyan Church in Canada. Uh, and, and Laurel was uh, being interviewed of, of why his church has, for so many generations, had such great uh, growth and success. Now, Laurel Buckingham is almost 80 years old, okay, just to give you a picture of his age. He's been at uh, the Montauk Church for about 45 years, long time. And uh, Carrie said, how are you doing this? Decade after decade, your church is impactful, it's growing, it's meeting needs in the community. And I was surprised to listen and hear uh, Laurel's response. Basically, he said, I am a student of culture. And what I've learned is that I have to change our language and change our approach as culture changes so that we can still bring the message of Jesus Christ to that culture in a way that they get I thought that's exactly what we've been going through here at uh, Grace Point for the last four weeks. That's been our purpose, is to try to understand the times we live in so that we can effectively bring the message of Jesus Christ in a language that the culture can get. You know, the Bible did this. If you read it with some uh, openness to this, you'll you'll see. Let me give you an example. In Acts chapter 2, after the uh, crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the disciples gather together, and it's the Feast of Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit comes upon this group of disciples as they're praying and, and anoints them, and they go out into the streets of Jerusalem, and they begin to proclaim in formerly unknown languages the wonders of God to the crowd that had gathered for Pentecost. They, they had come from many different regions and spoke many different languages, and they're all hearing the wonders and the story of God in their own languages. Well, that began to stir the crowd up, and some of them thought that the disciples were drunk. And, and Peter stood up, and, and he said this, um, uh, Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain what's going on here. And he, he proceeds to give this powerful message. And he gets uh, to one point in the message where he says, Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited to you by miracles and wonders and signs. You know who he is. You know what's going on here. And he continues to preach this really powerful message. He gets to the end of the message, and the people are struck to their hearts, and they say, What do we do? Then he says this. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. Um, and you're going to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What we tend to do as the evangelical community is we pull that last invitation right out of the context of where it took place. And we say, now, all we need to do is tell people, repent of your sin and believe in Jesus Christ and be baptized. And we, and we, we think we can just cold, cold cock people with that and they'll get it. But Think about what transpired in Acts chapter 2. First of all, you had a group that was familiar with the things of God. They knew about Messiah. Secondly, you had this powerful outpouring of the Holy Spirit that anointed the message. Thirdly, they knew who Jesus was. They knew that he was accredited by signs and powers and miracles. So they were ripe for this message of repent and believe in Jesus Christ and basically be born again, right? Do you see the cultural context of Jerusalem at that time? They were ripe for this. Let's flip over in the book of Acts to Acts chapter 17. Now we get to the Apostle Paul, one of my favorites. Wherever Paul went, there was riot or revival. So he goes to Berea, gets kicked out of there. He ends up in Athens. He's in Athens, and Paul did what he normally did while he's waiting for the disciples to catch up with him. He begins to preach the message of Jesus Christ to that place. So he goes to the synagogue and goes to the marketplace and preaches Christ. Well, in the marketplace, he runs into some philosophers, and they begin to dispute with him. And they say, what is this babbler saying to us? Something about a foreign god? They did not have the background of the people in Jerusalem. They did not know about Messiah. They had not witnessed Pentecost. They they didn't know who Jesus was. They had not seen his miraculous powers. And they go, who is this babbler? Paul, recognizing what was going on, begins to say to them, I noticed that you're very religious. 
You have altars all over the place, and you have an altar to an unknown God. Let me tell you about that unknown God. And he begins to talk about God the creator, God the sustainer, the one who does not live in temples made by human hands. He is not served by, you know, these kinds of things. He doesn't need it. And then he says he's, this verse that we love to quote, for in him we live and move and have our being. You know, we love to pull it out of the context of that and quote it. It's a good verse, right? And he goes on and continues to explain who God is to these folks. And he gets back to the resurrection once again, and they sneer at him. And he had a little bit of success. Some were born again, but most rejected the message of Christ. What's the difference? Well, Athens is not the same as Jerusalem. The cultures aren't the same. The receptivity to the message of Jesus Christ wasn't the same. And, and so if we just take the methodology of Acts chapter 2 and say, we just go into a culture like Athens, and all we got to do is proclaim the name of Jesus and tell people to repent and they're sinners, they're going to say, what are you babbling about? Instead, we have to do like Paul. We have to have some intuition, some insight, some prompting of the Holy Spirit where we say, okay, let me explain some things to you. I know you don't understand and, 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 and treat the culture in, in, with a language that they can understand. That's what we've been talking about for four weeks here. Okay, are you getting this? At Grace Point. Understanding the times we live in so that we can proclaim in a language that our culture gets. And, and not only that, I'm convinced of this. For such a time as we find ourselves in, we have to live our lives tremendously different. There has to be a power demonstrated in our lives that we are truly a follower of Jesus Christ. And out of that changed life, we're going to have the platform then to have a proclamation of, of, of a message in Christ. Amen? You getting what I'm saying here? It's super important to get how these go together. So, today we turn a corner. Last four weeks, we talked about the times we live in. This morning, I'm going to talk about now virtues that we need to begin to live out in the times we find ourselves in. In Matthew chapter 26, you can read how Judas the betrayer, one of Jesus' 12 disciples, arrives um, with a mob in, in tow, so to speak, uh, to arrest Jesus. And Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples praying. Well, Jesus was praying, the disciples were having a nap, actually. Um, so Judas shows up and kisses the Lord, and, and the mobs with him there, appointed by the chief priests and the elders to arrest uh, Jesus. And they, they have clubs and they have swords. It's an unrestrained kind of moment going on there. It's a chaotic moment. And we're told one of the disciples of Christ pulls out his sword, chops off the high priest's ear. I mean, you're talking unrestrained by the crowd arresting Jesus. You're talking about unrestrained by, by the reaction of this disciple who we later read is Peter. And in the middle of all this, there's Jesus. He reaches up and he heals the servant's ear. He said the people that are going to arrest him and crucify him. And then he says to the one who had pulled out the sword and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his ear, put your sword away. Those who live by the sword die by the sword. And then he says this. I, I love this. He says this. Don't you understand that I have at my disposal 12 legions of angels I could call on? Now, at that time, a legion of angels that he's referring to would probably be referred back to a Roman legion, which a Roman legion was 6,000 people. So basically, Jesus is saying, I have 72,000 angels at my disposal. Don't you think I could call on them if I wanted to stop this thing? But this has to happen so that the word of God is fulfilled. So here's the first virtue, I think, that we really need to begin to think about because we live in a very unrestrained culture. Would you agree with me on that? And in this interaction, we see Jesus dealing with very unrestrained people, whether it be the mob or whether it be his own disciples. Here's, I think, the first virtue we need to really begin to grapple with. Jesus modeled restraint among the unrestrained. He modeled for us something we need to grab a hold of. Restraint among the unrestrained. Jesus was not governed by the impulse of the moment. He wasn't governed by the passion of being in the right. He wasn't governed by the power at his disposal. Rather, he was governed by his Father's will and the mission for his life. We look like Jesus folk, 
get this, we look like Jesus when we're not governed by our impulses. We look like Jesus when we're not governed by our perceived rightness on an issue. We look like Jesus when we're not governed by the power at our disposal. We look like Jesus when we're controlled by the Father's will and the person of the Holy Spirit living in us and by the ways of our Lord Jesus. So this morning in our Remnant series, we're turning this distinct corner. We're leaving this exploration of the times we live in, so to speak, to understanding the virtues that we need to live out now for such a time as this. We're going to address the question of what kind of people should we be as we find ourselves in the margins of culture, when we're pushed to this outer edge of, of, of what could be perceived as, as influence into the culture. And this morning we're looking at having restraint among the unrestrained. If, if, you're, if you're really looking at this with any kind of honest evaluation, you have got to see that there's a trajectory that goes uphill towards unrestrained in our culture. It's getting more and more unrestrained all the time. And when I use the word we have to be restrained, I'm not meaning we are indifferent. I'm not meaning we're detached or unemotional. I'm kind of an emotional person. Are you? It's okay to have some emotions. I do not watch the Vikings live anymore because I can't take that emotion of disappointment. So I, I record it, and if they win, I watch them. If they lose, I just delete the recording. Um, that's being smart with your emotions. But un, uh, restraint doesn't mean you don't have fun. I like to have fun. There's nothing wrong with having fun. It, it, it doesn't mean you're not zealous or you're not passionate. I hope we're the most passionate people around. But what it means when we have restraint is that we're restrained by our love of Jesus Christ. We're restrained by the guidance of the Holy Spirit living in us. It means I'm not governed by physical impulses. They don't control my life. It means I am not seduced by a culture far from God. It does not set my agenda. It means I'm not buying in to the philosophies of this world that are contrary to God because I know God's word rules supreme in my life. God's ways are often wrongly viewed as restrictive and rules and legalism and all that rather than life-giving. At the end of the summer in Nevada, the desert of Nevada, in August, there's a gathering for those who want to show, throw off all restraint. It's called the Burning Man Gathering. They build this huge man. It's, you could see the picture there on the right. Kind of looks like a human figure. And what they do is they all gather and they have this time of unrestraint, whatever that means. And then at the end of that time, they burn this man, symbolizing it's now all's forgotten, we're going to go back to life as is, as boring as it is. And what's interesting in this gathering in Nevada, there can be 50 to 70,000 people in the desert going to this burning man festival, for lack of a better word, and it looks like a city in the middle of the desert. And it's a time of unrestraint, giving into impulse kind of thing. And then they burn this man at the end of it saying, we're done now, on to life as normal, as boring as it may be. The Apostle Paul said, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you must not live any longer as these people do. In the futility of their thinking, you would say we're taught to put off your old self, to be new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on Christ. We live in a Bernie Man culture. Unrestraint is planned for. There's a self-absorbed, pleasure-seeking thing going on. It's not going to last. It's hollow. It's shallow. It's meaningless. It'll ultimately burn up. God has called us to be a remnant in these times of restraint, of a control by the Holy Spirit, of living lives very different than cultures promoting. Let me ask you to ponder this. Would Jesus walk this earth? We could say he thrived, that he did really well, that he had a good experience, right? Even though he had to go to death for us. We, we'd say Jesus did all things well, right? The Bible says that. He did everything well. Yet Jesus wasn't about power or position or prestige and all the things that the world seeks to go after Instead, he had this calm, steadfast fixation 
on God, His ways, and His plans. And that was foundational then to His well-being, to His thriving as a person. And I know some of us may say, well, you know what? He's God! After all, God does well! When you ask Jesus Christ into your life, you get God. You get the person of the Holy Spirit living in you. So when we use the excuse and we see Jesus doing well while he's God, you don't know your Bible. You don't know the package. You get the Holy Spirit. So we too should do well. We should thrive in our God. Amen? Amen? Not, not enough. Amen? You know, I went to Mark Gunger and he said, Man, the people here, they don't respond. I said, you ought to come on Sunday morning. You know, but at any rate, we need to understand that in Christ, we are to experience something that's beyond this world. We're to understand that in God, we have life. Not in God, we don't have life. We really have death. Moses, this great leader over the uh, people Israel, back in the day, was God's instrument for so much impartation of God's ways and laws to us. Now, we as born-again believers in Jesus Christ, having the person of the Holy Spirit living inside us, we now know that this law, this way that was given throughout much of the Bible is the way of life, and through the Holy Spirit living in us, we can embrace these ways as the way to do life, as, as life-giving, and we can, they can become a living in us. Amen? That's what the Bible says. Um, but get this. The law that like Moses gave us in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, it can't save you, right? Amen? Some of you are nodding your head. You just won't say amen, will you? Amen? The, the law can't save us. The law can't make us right. We can't earn our way to God. The law can't do that. It can show us we're a sinner, and it can become something that's living and active, and that's when we follow Jesus Christ. But it cannot save us, right? Because much of the world thinks God, law, rules, I obey him, I'm okay. We can't buy that for a moment. Because that's the way of the world. That's death that doesn't work. But having received Jesus Christ, then we ought to say, God, your ways are the ways of life. And life to the full. Listen to the words that Moses spoke at the end of Deuteronomy after God used him to part all these ways and laws to us. Here's what he said in verses 19 through 20 of Deuteronomy 30. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you what? Life and death. Blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God. Listen to his voice and hold fast to him, for the Lord is your life, and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So today, here's what we're going to look at. What it means to choose life and not death. What it means to choose life and not death. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the Life. So choosing life begins when we choose Jesus Christ. When we give our lives to him as our Savior, we are choosing life. Amen? If you have not yet done that, and you're sitting here this morning, you have not yet chosen life. You have, by that not choosing life, have chosen death. I'll tell you the implications of that in a moment. Once born again in Christ, having chosen life, then we have to begin to look at God's ways as Life. And every time we decide to follow his ways, we are choosing what? Life, not death, because that's the right way to do life. This culture we live in will mess up your mind when it comes to this. This culture will say and promote that God is about killing fun. God's about rules and legalism and control and all that. But God isn't about that. He's about life, and he's about life to the full. He came so that we can have life and thrive. About a year ago, Vicki and I bought a little camper. It came with a plethora of manuals. I hate manuals. To me, they're a waste of time. Any of you males agree with me in here? So I didn't read them. I cursory read them. So then we decided to go on a vacation to Utah in March. 
I have not read the manuals. So we leave after church, and we're driving west. It's 30 degrees. We get to our campsite about 1 o'clock, because like most guys, I don't know when to stop. I thought, well, we could just get like eight hours in today. We'll get almost there. So it's cold out. We pull into this little campsite by this golf course, which I couldn't even believe it existed. No hookups, but this campsite. I thought, well, great. We have a camper. It doesn't need hookups. Trouble is, I don't know how to run it. So I remember getting to the camper, and I'm looking at Vicky. I don't know how to turn the furnace on. I don't know if it's safe to use the gas part of the furnace yet. So we'll just put extra blankets on and gut it out tonight. It's 30 degrees. We froze. Shivered all night long. After four hours of shivering, losing some weight, nothing else, we looked at each other and said, let's just go. This isn't worth it. And we got in the car and left that place. I said, I need to figure out how to run that furnace, don't I? Yes. She's a very gracious girl. We survived the night, but we did not thrive through the night. Did you hear that? We survived, but we did not thrive. That, my friends, is the condition of so many followers of God because we don't embrace his ways as life. We don't read the manual. We don't take it into our hearts. We are surviving the night, but we're not thriving. And if we're going to impact our culture, we need to live the power of God. We need to live different, and we need to thrive, not just survive. Do you know what? Life is equals thriving. It means an enlarging existence. For death equals shriveling, a diminishing existence. As a faithful remnant, as we follow Jesus Christ, heeding the words he gave us, heeding the words of Revelation in the Bible, we are expanding our existence. We are increasing, having an enlarging experience. But if we reject Jesus Christ, which most of the world has done, and they don't know this, but they're experiencing a diminishing existence, a shriveling existence. That's what they're, they don't know it. And if you and I come to Jesus, but then we don't really heed his word, and we live like the world lives, we are not choosing life. We are choosing shriveling. We are becoming a raisin instead of a grape. We are shriveling up. We're having a diminishing existence. And then we're no earthly good to all the rest who are diminishing. Because they look at us and they say, you are no different than me. You have nothing to offer to me. But if we will thrive in our Jesus, if we will live life to the full in him and choose life, then much of the world will come to us and say at some point, I know you're in the margins, but why are you doing so well? Why are you thriving? Now, Thriving is more than physically thriving, which is one of the ways we do physical thriving. We can do well monetarily or whatever. But listen, when I use the word thriving, it's that you and I have a hope that's unquenchable. That we are not being governed by tragedy and we're not being fear-based followers, but we have a hope that's unquenchable. We have Peace that's above the turmoil. Got what I'm saying here? Because Jesus is reigning supreme in our heart. We have a love that's way above hate. When we begin to be this kind of people, even though we find ourselves in the margins, every now and then people are going to make their way out of the center of culture and they're going to say, why do you have love? Why do you have peace? Why do you have hope when the world is this terrible, ugly place? You are demonstrating then the power of Acts 2 in your life. And now you have to have the proclamation to go along with it. You have to give the reason for the hope you have in Jesus Christ. Okay? See how this works? In Leviticus chapter 18, God says his people are to do life differently, fundamentally differently because they know he is God. Listen to what is said in verses 1 through 5, now Leviticus 18. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, I'm the Lord your God. You must not do as they do in Egypt, where you used to live, and you must not do as they do in the land of Canaan, where I'm bringing you. Do not follow their practices. You must obey my laws and be careful to follow my decrees. I am the Lord your God. Keep my decrees and law, for the person who obeys them will live by them. I am the Lord. 
So God's way are a doorway to life, okay? God's way are a doorway to life. I want to drill down on this just a little bit with you. I want to use an example so that it's not just too philosophical for you this morning. I'm going to use the example of sexuality in our culture right now. I think it's an easy thing for us to understand that the operative word when it comes to sexuality is unrestraint right now. Anything you do is okay. That's kind of what culture is teaching us. If you disagree with that, you will be marginalized. Right? You'll be pushed to the margins. You'll be looked at as prudish or out of touch or not realistic or, or living in la-la land or whatever the terminology is used sometimes to, to denigrate people that have a, 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 a more biblical view of sexuality. It is said that it, a man who sires multiple children but does not father them, which when I mean by father, does not at least financially take care of them or are present for them, that that will ultimately cost society about $800,000. I don't know where they get that number from. It's big. And oftentimes, we've been told in culture, I have freedom, I can do sexuality, I can do anything I want. Yeah, but there are societal consequences to the community. See, the world says it's individualistic in its orientation, but yet the reality is it's communal in its implications. Amen? You seeing this? If you came to laugh your way to, marriage, uh, to a better marriage by Mark Gunger, which you should have done, if you didn't do, you missed out. He was talking about some things that I've known for a long time but are really important. He was saying, pornography leads to dysfunction in sex. It leads to a dysfunctional sexual life. Multiple sex partners does not enhance your sexual problems. It usually leads to more dysfunction than health. The world says, get on that horse and ride it. You know, I hear guys say, well, you know, I'm going to take her out for a test drive before I marry her. What? She's not a car. Amen? You don't need to practice at this stuff. You'll figure it out. Practice doesn't make perfect. Practice causes problems. The world says it's just a biological urge. God says, no, it's something sacred. It's beyond that. If you believe the Bible, you will be called prudish and backwards and not realistic and get in the real world, blah, blah, blah. And we as Christians have found ourselves in the margins when it comes to this topic of sexuality. It's been the case for a long time. But if you do it God's way, you'll thrive. You'll have an enlarging experience. If you do it the world's way, you'll experience a diminishing experience. You'll shrivel up. It won't satisfy. Do we believe that? Because it's true. Let me give you more example on human sexuality where it's misinterpreted. God gives a big list of do nots on human sexuality when it comes to Leviticus 18 and, and 20. Let me just give you the list and then talk about why the list is even there. Here's what he says. No sex. Here's examples of no sex with a close relative. Definitely not with mom. Ooh, you know. Sisters are off limits. Yeah, I hope so. Your sons and daughters, daughters and sons are off limits. A neighbor's wife, off limits. Don't lie with a man like you would lie with a woman, off limits. Animals are a no-no. You go, what is going on with this list? And if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, you're going to say, see, God's about wrecking my fun. No, this is about promoting life. These are two fences that promote life right here. This is what this is all about. First of all, this is about protection of the powerless. Back in the time of Leviticus, men had tremendous power in that culture. This restrained them. Secondly, it's about protection of the family and definition of the family. If the family is lost, if it's not defined, culture will soon be lost. We're experiencing that right now. Lose the family, lose the culture. It's football season, isn't it? Woohoo! Go Jacks, right? A lot of points yesterday. At any rate, at a football game, it's not uncommon to see a couple guys come with a big, what, D and a fence. What's that stand for? Defense. I know. It's boring. I agree. It's been done a thousand times before, but it, somebody always thinks it's a new novel idea. So you see a big D and a big fence. What if you're sitting behind that guy that whole game long? What are you going to see? 
that stupid fence. I thought, if I go to a Vikings game and I pay several hundred dollars for a ticket, I don't want to be behind those two. They would bother me. It would annoy me. I might even say something. I don't know if I would or not because I'm thinking I'm not seeing the game. Listen, God's law, though, God's ways should be like that fence. You can't see life around them. You see it through them. And they're a protection for us as followers. I think it's fair to say that most of, of culture today think God's about rules, rules of the don't kind, you know, that will damper life. We can't buy that. We have to understand God's rules are like a fence of protection. He puts them up so we know where to play life rightly. And that means we have to embrace them as life-giving. In the margins, we church people have to become a little bit more reflective, a little bit more understanding of what's going on. And we have to choose Jesus Christ and choose his ways. And, and so, basically today we're talking about living a life of restraint in the midst of unrestrained culture. Jesus, when he talks to us in the Sermon on the Mount, he kind of gets at some of this stuff too. Um, he, he sits down on the side of this mountain and he begins to teach the crowd that was with him. And I love one of the Beatitudes. The Sermon on the Mount begins with Beatitudes, um, the way you ought to be in your mind. Um, he, gets, he gives this Beatitude in Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's kind of what we're talking about today. Blessed are the restrained among the unrestrained, because they go to see God. See, pure means free from pollution and guilt of sin. And if you're unrestrained, you're going to jump right into the pollution and say, I want to be right in the middle of that pollution, but what does pollution do to you? Come on, we live in this environmentally, politically correct culture. What does pollution do to you? It kills you, right? How many of you would say, I, I, I don't mind a little lead in my water? No big deal. It's, even if it's meeting standards. A little bit of arsenic. That never hurt anybody, amen? Make me stronger. How about some carcinogens? Let's throw those in there too. I'll drink some carcinogens. No big deal. Most of us run out by a filter. We do something to try to correct the issue. We want to be free from pollution. We want to be free from the guilt of sin. That's what our culture needs to see in us. So what restraint do I need to show to be pure becomes the reflection question I want to leave you with this morning. What restraint do I need to show to be pure? I gave you some space to write something out in there. Think on this. In what ways is the power of God not, not reigning supreme in my life that it needs to so that I can have a platform to proclaim the message of Jesus to this culture? And when I say what restraint do I need to show to be pure, I'm talking about restraint in media, for instance. Um, used to be in church circles who didn't go to the media because it was big, bad, movies were bad and all that. Now we seem to have gone the other way. Yeah, it's no big deal. But you have to begin to ask yourself, is this good for my soul? Is this good for my spirit? Even when media isn't that bad, movies or whatever, they distort. Have you noticed that? You go to a movie, there's a good guy, there's a bad guy, and most of the movie's about the good guy annihilating the bad guy, and we go, yay. Well, we're all bad guys, aren't we? There is no one good, not one, only God. Jesus said those words. So when we begin to root in the movies, good guy, annihilate bad guy, we're going, <sighs> think about where that really leads to you and I. It's bad theology. It distorts. What restraint do I need to show to be pure when it comes to my routine in my life? I'm going to do something routine that's wrong? It's not good for me, body, soul, and spirit? Am I doing something? Stop it. Begin to live for Jesus Christ in that area. Is there restraint I need to show to be pure when it comes to the internet? Am I replacing relationships with Facebook? <laughs> <sighs> What people say on Facebook, I'm going, ah, don't say that. And why are you putting it on Facebook? Show some restraint. Show some understanding. Deal with real people. Social media is not a substitute for real relationship. What restraint do I need to show to be pure? What restraint do I need to show to be pure when it comes to people in my life on how I speak and do I get angry and do I give into peer pressure and do I think I'm old in life and do I need recognition? You get what I'm saying here? When we show restraint, when we are pure in heart, so to speak, guess what? We're noticeably different from the rest of culture. Count on being mocked for being restraint, showing restraint. Count on being mocked. Count on being called names and labeled. But understand this. As we dwell in the cult, culture's edges, in the margins, 
as restrained people, filled with the love of Jesus Christ, controlled by the person of the Holy Spirit, loving God's word, we will thrive. We'll have hope that's unquenchable. We'll have peace that's above the turmoil, right? And we'll be characterized that way. Every now and then, people who are in the center of culture who don't know any better will come over and say, why are you so different? What is going on in your life? Because they're seeing a demonstration of the power of God, like what was seen in Acts chapter 2. They're going to ask, what do I need to do? And then we have to be ready to proclaim the hope that we have is in Jesus Christ. The hope that we have is in Jesus Christ. That's why restraint in the midst of unrestrained culture matters so much. It's not legalism. I'm not talking about legalism. In fact, you know what Pastor Laura Buckingham said was the biggest change he's seen in the church in the last five decades that he thought is a good change? A move away from legalism. He said that was always in our way. He said the problem now is that the church has really thrown it all off and they don't even do church anymore very well. We don't even think we need to meet and gather together anymore. We don't even think we need to do anything. He said we've gotten to the other extreme of being too casual. So what we need to have is the Holy Spirit reigning in us, loving God's law, loving the gathering of the fellowship of the saints, and being willing then to proclaim the reason for the hope that you have is Jesus Christ, as people seeing you live differently. Amen? I need to stop. I'm going to preach a second message, and you don't need to hear that. Let's, let's pray, and we're going to close with a song today. Lord God, I want to thank you for... Uh, this morning, this opportunity just to share some things that really were, have been on my heart for a long time. God, would you grace us to be people who show restraint in the midst of an unrestrained culture? By that, I mean, Lord, that we're just, we're, we're, we're loving Jesus. We're filled with the person of the Holy Spirit. He's prompting us and guiding us and convicting us and all that, Lord. And we're loving your word and we're embracing your words. It's a way of life. And we're experiencing in life that thriving, that expanding existence, Lord. Would you, would you help us at Grace Point to, to truly be that kind of people? If any be here this morning that haven't taken that very first step of really receiving you, Jesus, as, as, as their Savior, I pray they would step into life. I pray they choose life today. I pray they choose you, Jesus, to follow you. And I pray for those of us who have been in Jesus that we continue to choose life. We choose your ways. God, we don't want to just survive the night. We want to thrive through the night. So help us embrace your manual, your word, as the way to do life. God, we love you so very much. I pray you bless the people of Grace Point. Fill them with your hope, Jesus. Fill them with your peace, Jesus, so that we're noticeably different during these times we find ourselves in. And even if we're marginalized on things like sexuality or, or whatever be the case, Lord, we got to understand that as we abide in your ways, our life still expands. Our life still has more meaning, and eventually people will make their way to us and ask, what's going on? Why are you so different? Why are you so contented? And give us the wisdom to proclaim then, Jesus, what we're all about. I pray these things in your name and by your blood, Jesus. Amen.